Today's lecture will cover convergent and transform plate boundaries with a special emphasis on California's formation as a result of the geologic processes at both ocean continental and transform plate boundaries. Terms to know are subduction and subduction zones, ocean trench, accretionary wedge, partial melting, fore arc basin, back arc basin, and volcanic arcs. So there are three types of convergent plate boundaries. There are ocean plates that can converge with other ocean plates, and when that happens, volcanic arcs are created. Japan would be an example, the Aleutian Islands, as well as other places on Earth that we'll uh, talk about. Ocean to continent is where an ocean plate converges with a continental plate, and we have volcanic mountain ranges that are formed as a result of that. With these two, the ocean to ocean and ocean to continent, an ocean trench and a subduction zone will form. When two continental plates collide with each other, both plates are too buoyant to be dragged under uh, one or the other. The, remember granite, Continental crust is more granitic, so granitic is um, a buoyant rock. It's less dense, so it's the beach ball. It isn't going to be dragged down into the asthenosphere. So we have just these two continental plates that are crashing into each other. So over time, we'll have big mountain ranges as a result of that. And today, that is what's happening to form the Himalaya Mountains. In the past, the Appalachian Mountains, the Ural Mountains, and the Alps have all formed by two continental plates smashing into each other. So this is the Aleutian Islands, and you see all the red triangles. Those are all volcanoes that have erupted within the past 200 years. So it's a very active place, just a line of volcanoes, volcanic islands that have been formed from the North Amer the, the oceanic part of the North America plate uh, colliding with the Pacific uh, Ocean, but the Pacific plate, I should say. So the Pacific plate is subducting underneath the North America plate. And this line that has the little triangles on it, that indicates the, the subduction zone and the ocean trench here. So that is the Aleutian Trench. Trenches are always associated with subduction zones. And this is the type of volcanoes uh, that are going to be formed uh, in a situation like this. These are all stratovolcanoes or composite volcanoes. Hopefully you remember those terms from our volcanoes uh, lesson. Um, they have this kind of concave symmetrical look and they're the most explosive, the most violent eruptions are associated with this type of volcano. That's the Cleveland volcano in the Aleutian Islands. And here it is with uh, a lava flow pouring down the side of the mountain. You see the snow and the snow is melting as a result of the, of the heated lava. And this can uh, cause volcanic mud flows or lahars. This is another one. There are lots of these volcanoes uh, that St. Augustine in the Aleutian Islands, and they all have that same sort of shape. That's Pinatubo. Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines in 1991. The Philippines are another one of those volcanic island arcs from two ocean plates uh, converging with each other. Then ocean continent convergence. Currently, the volcanic mountains of the Cascades are being formed as a result of the Juan de Fuca plate subducting underneath the North America plate, and volcanic mountains of the Andes in South America are resulting from the Nazca plate, an oceanic plate, subducting under the South America plate, a continental plate. And most of the western U.S. from Utah to California formed this way up until about 28 million years ago when the plate motion along what, what's now Southern California changed to a transform plate motion. So a lot of our continent has been built by this um, ocean continent convergence. So in ocean continental, uh, at ocean continental plate boundaries, 
the oceanic plate will subduct underneath the continental plate because the oceanic plate is composed of more dense rocks. Continental volcanic arcs form from the rising magma uh, as that ocean plate melts, portions of the ocean plate melt and accretionary wedges form at continental plate edges. We'll talk more about what that is. Remember accretion is just where small things grow larger through collisions. And four arc basins form between the volcanic mountain range and the accretionary wedge. Plutons that are gonna be formed from that melted um, um, subducting plate uh, will form and they cool underground. And as I said before, the Andes Mountains in South America and the Cascade Range in the Western, uh, in Western North America, um, Northern California, Washington, Oregon, into Southern British Columbia are all forming this way. So just to give you a little sketch here, my lovely, beautiful sketching, um, Here's the Pacific Plate. This is the Pacific Plate here. So, uh, so this is a mid-ocean ridge. So that's the Pacific Plate on this side. The Farallon Plate is here. So there were a, over 200 million years worth of subduction that built the Western US. And it was this Farallon Plate that was being subducted underneath the North America Plate here. So subduction takes place. Some of that those rocks, those ophiolites that we talked about that form at these mid-ocean ridges or the sediments that are um, uh, settling down onto the bottom of the ocean floor forming our cherts and our limestones, they formed here. And those, some of those rocks end up being plucked up by the leading edge of that overriding continental plate. It will scrape up some of those rocks. And that's where we get the accretion wedge. And sometimes we refer to this as successive slices of seafloor. And these rocks sometimes can be just perfect the way they were formed. But most of the time they're crunched, they're mangled, they're tangled, they're folded because of the massive crunching forces that are going on here. So that for California, those rocks became what is now our coast range. All right, so subduction was taking place. Part of the ocean rocks were melting. Again, seawater is mixed in. That's what lowers the melting point, and we get magma that forms. So the magma begins to rise under the overriding continental plate. In this particular case, that was the North America plate. And we end up with volcanoes that are being fueled. All right, well, over this over 200 million years worth of this going on, we had these volcanoes, just like the volcanoes in the Aleutian Islands or the volcanoes that you would see in the Philippines, they were being formed, um, but I'm sorry, they weren't volcanic islands, they were volcanoes, they were stratovolcanoes that were being formed, but not islands, they were in a, in the, on the edge of the continent. Um, and over the millions of years, these were weathering away Volcano, if you remember, they're just nothing more than rotten mountains. They're not held together very well at all. So as soon as they were exposed at the surface, Mother Nature started doing her thing. Rivers and streams and rains would come and wash this stuff into the shallow marine environment. And that's what this is trying to show here, that these are just layer after layer after layer of sediments that are accumulating offshore from this uh, volcanic mountain range. And over time, those lithified into sandstones, mudstones, and siltstones. And that is what we are in in the Central Valley. Those layers of rocks became the Central Valley. Now, those layers of rocks are miles beneath our feet now because we've had younger sediments that have washed in. But there are places that we can go, and I'll show you pictures. There are places that we can go to see these rocks. They're kind of standing on edge now. Some of them are mangled and contorted and crunched up, but some of them are pretty unique and, and interesting to look at. Then, as all this was going on, we had these plutons, th these magma uh, chambers that were solidifying. So, all these volcanoes ended up disappearing, especially after the San Andreas Fault formed that started pushing all of this ocean 
continental plate boundary to the north. So over most of California now, you don't see that ocean continental plate boundary. You have to go up to Northern California around Crescent City, that area up there, before you are offshore, you're gonna find this type of plate boundary. It's the San Andreas Fault that makes up most of California's plate boundary now. And that formed as a result of what we'll talk about later at this mid-ocean ridge. At some point, we ran out of Farallon plate. It was all being subducted, it was all being melted, and this mid-ocean ridge arrived at California's shore. And on this mid-ocean ridge, we had transform plate boundaries. When the continental plate moved over those transform plate boundary, that transform plate boundary, it changed the motion. And that motion started pushing that, that sliding past motion started pushing that ocean continental boundary to the north. And over time, this is uh, where it is now, is in Northern California and off Washington, Oregon, and as I said, Southern British Columbia. So we'll get a little bit more into that. Just That's just a brief explanation of what is happening at an ocean to continental plate boundary and how California got here. But not just California, because remember, there was a, a, over 200 million years that this was going on. So you, we're just the latest um, addition of this subduction. You go to the foothills, you go into the Sierra Nevada, you go into Western um, uh, Nevada, and you see different sequences of coast range, Central Valley, old volcanic mountain ranges. So this is where we're located now. This is off of uh, Washington. So here's the Cascadia subduction zone here. Uh, there's the trench out here, and here's that subducting slab. Now, the name of this slab, let me get a pen here, see if I can write this. Uh, pen, uh, one E. Whoa, that's not working right. One, that's J U A N. I don't know why that's doing that. One de Fuca, D E. That's an F U C A. I don't know why I have all of those. Juan de Fuca. That is one of the slivers of the old Farallon plate that was a remnant. Uh, when the transform faults um, hit Southern California, two sections of the Farallon plate got broken apart. One went to the north, one went to the south. So the one that is in the north right now is the Juan de Fuca plate, and it's subducting underneath North America to form the Cascade Mountains. So Northern California, we have uh, Medicine Lake, we have, Shasta, we have Mount Shasta, we have Mount Lassen, and then we go into Oregon, and we have um, the Crater Lake, we have Mount Jefferson, Mount Adams, and then all the volcanoes in Washington, like Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, we've got all of those there. And they're all a result of the subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate. So here's our trench right here. There's our subduction zone. Let me see what I can get here to help us out. Laser pointer. So here's our subduction zone. And right here, this little wedge of material right here, those are rocks that are being scraped up. Those are ocean floor rocks ophiolites that are being scraped up by the leading edge of the continental plate. This is accretion. This is an accretionary wedge and this is how continents grow because they will pick up these pieces, they will scrape up these sections of seafloor and add to the leading edge of the continent. So here we go again. I want you to know these names. I want you to know what's happening here. So this is the subducting oceanic lithosphere. This is partial melting that's taking place. Again, that's happening because water is being dragged down as the ocean floor subducts. And these are the plutons that are fueling the, the volcanic arcs. These are magma chambers. Here's the four arc basin. That is the technical term for what became the Central Valley. 
And here is the accretionary wedge. The accretionary wedge is the technical term for what became the coast ranges. And the coast ranges just consist of these different sequences of those ocean floor rocks. So one of the, if you remember the ophiolites, the one that formed from mantle magma is um, peridotite. When peridotite reacts with water, as it does when it's subducted here, it becomes serpentinite. Serpentinite is our state rock. So serpentinite, um, pillow basalt, and chert, um, those were called Steinman's Trinity. Steinman was um, a meteorologist in Europe that would see these three rocks and mountain ranges that he, that he was studying, and he knew that they formed on the ocean floor, but he could not figure out why they were showing up in, uh, on continents or in mountain ranges on continents. And that's because plate tectonics wasn't known at the time. So um, Steinman was visiting a good friend of his in Berkeley, who was a, uh, a professor at Berkeley by the name of Andrew Lawson. And Andrew Lawson took him over into the coast range. And lo and behold, what did he find? He found Steinman's Trinity there. He found serpentinite, he found chert, and he found pillow basalt. Where you find one, you find the others. They might not be right next to each other, but they're going to be in close proximity. Again, no explanation for why this, is, uh, this was happening. We had to wait for plate tectonic, the plate tectonic revolution to come along to understand how ocean floor rocks can end up on land. And then the magma chambers right here. Once the weight of these volcanoes had gone away because they were being eroded and washing out into this four arc basin into layer after layer after layer of sediment, once the weight was lifted off these, this, this granitic rock here rose to the surface. So this is the ancestral Sierra Nevada right here. When you are when you are uh, in the Sierra Nevada, you are actually walking in an old magma chamber. It's actually uh, granitic rocks. We call it granite. It's actually um, granodiorite. But when you think about, here's um, basalt, which is a mafic rock subducting under continental rock, which is a granitic rock. Well, what's going to be the, the makeup of the magma? We have mafic, felsic here. So what should be the makeup of the magma that comes out? Well, ideally, it should be intermediate. And diorite is an intermediate right, um, inter in intermediate chemical composition rock. Um, but nobody calls, calls the um, Sierra Nevada uh, diorite. We all just say it's granite. Um, and Mother Earth is messy too. So do we find felsic rocks being formed? Yeah, we do. It all happens through magmatic differentiation or magmatic fractionals, fractionalization. We will find math, uh, we will find mafic, we will find intermediate, and we'll also find felsic composition rocks. So if you see a diagram like this, you should be able to label all these features. What is going on here? Well, out here, what is that feature? It's underwater. And if we had to draw arrows here, I'm gonna get this pen again and try to draw some arrows. I don't know what's happening with this thing. Let's see if it works. No, it doesn't. Uh, I don't know why I'm getting double here. So there, and there. So that's divergence taking place here. And then this is all being pushed. So think of this over here as the Farallon plate. Oops, it went over onto the Pacific plate. Uh, get rid of that. Um, this is Farallon plate here, and there's the trench, and here's the accretion wedge. This is the subduction zone, and this plate is moving this way this plate moving this way. So some of those ophiolites are being plucked up. That's the accretionary wedge. This is the four arc basin here, shallow offshore. And then this is that volcanic arc 
here. I'm sorry, I don't know why I keep getting these horizontal lines here. Um, and then down here, this is what became what we have today up, up in the, uh, the Sierra Nevada. So this would be the coast range right here. Let me get the laser pointer. Laser pointer. So that is the, the coast range right here. This is the Central Valley or what will become the Central Valley. And this is what will become the Sierra Nevada. And then all that stretching that's taking place in Nevada that we talked about with divergence, that's what's going on here. This is called a back arc basin. Let's erase all the ink and see if I can do that again. Uh, I don't know. Oh well. So this is, uh, this is that sequence of rocks called the Great Valley Sequence. This is what, if we're in Sacramento and American River College, this is what's about two to three miles underneath our feet. All the other stuff's all this nice sediment that is washed in in modern times um, to make such fertile uh, agricultural area. But the rocks underneath, just these interbedded, and you can see some of the beds are thicker than others. So they're interbedded layers of sandstone, some gray wacky in here, remember dirty sandstone, shale, siltstone. This is um, a, a pretty obvious and pretty spectacular rock formation at the Monticello Dam, which is the dam that uh, Lake Berryessa is backed up behind. Uh, and there's a, a pullover, uh, areas for cars to pull over, and you can just you know, be agog looking at the other, um, on the other side of the road at these layer after layer after layer of these rocks that were sediments that were washing in from those old volcanoes that had formed when the Farallon plate was subducting underneath the North America plate. And then all through the coast range, you see these mangled, tangled rocks. There will be serpentinite in these rocks. That's one of the reasons that the coast range is, is uh, so slide prone, because serpentinite is just a slick rock. It gives a good slide plane, and you don't have any really good integrity in the rock beds that you have here. They're just all crumpled up. Um, all of these rocks getting mushed up together in that accretionary wedge. So that all up and down California coast, we have that accretion wedge and that's why we have slides all over the place. And if you're around Big Sur or in our uh, Devil's Slide area, south of San Francisco, um, there's always work going on uh, on the highways to keep, uh, keep people safe from things that are uh, either rocks that are falling or slides that are occurring from below or sorry, from above. And then this is from a great book called A Rough Hewn Land. This is my go-to book for a lot of things. It's written by Keith Heyer Meldahl. He's a professor uh, at um, somewhere in San Diego, I think. I don't remember what school he's teaching at there, but he's a great writer. He's got some really good diagrams in the book. So a rough hewn land, it's all about how the West formed. So here we go. Here are those slices of seafloor. Let me grab a laser pointer again. Here are those successive slices of seafloor. Ophiolites, coast, coast range ophiolite, Great Valley ophiolite here, ophiolites here. So this would be the the Central Valley, and then this is uh, the sequence of slices of seafloor and the foothills of the Sierra. And then here are the volcanoes of the Sierra Nevada, but that ancestral Sierra Nevada, but this is what we have today, just those solidified magma chambers that rose to the surface. And the other unique thing about this is with all that seawater, there were um, and all that magma that, that was being generated when 
uh, the subduction was taking place, underground water got heated by the, uh, by the nearby magma and it dissolved gold and quartz and other minerals out. So that's why we have in, uh, in the foothills, we have um, gold deposits and the gold usually forms along with the quartz. And there are also other deposits, uh, lead, copper, successive slices of seafloor. Now, if we go to the other side of the Sierra Nevada, we're gonna find more slices of seafloor. Uh, so our California slices of seafloor on the coast right now, those were just the latest um, addition of those um, rocks that were plucked up when subduction was going on. And then this is showing the Nazca plate. We also have the Cocos plate. So the Cocos plate is the southern part of that Farallon plate. Uh, the Juan de Fuca up here was the northern part. Uh, Cocos was the southern part. And then here's the Nazca plate. And you see we got subduction going on. This is just a, a, a picture of a big old copper mine. So those deposits are there as a result of the magma. Um, heating up the underground water and that water ended up dissolving uh, these things, leaching these things out of rocks and they were deposited uh, um, elsewhere. So this is the Cascadia uh, subduction zone and this is an example of where we have three plate boundaries. Up here, this is our mid-ocean ridge here so we have divergence that's taking place. So we'll see these arrows that pop up here in a second, I hope. Yeah, there we go. So um, here's the spreading center. So a divergent plate boundary. But look here, you can't have on a globe, on a sphere, you can't have something splitting itself open in a, like a straight linear line. It has to have these accommodating breaks and that's what you're looking at here. That's one of those accommodating breaks and that's a transform fault. Look at the motion. This side's moving this way. This side of this mid-ocean ridge is moving this way. So right here, that's a transform fault. That side to side, that sliding past motion. So as a result of this lava coming up at these mid-ocean ridges, we have these volcanic vents on the bottom of the ocean floor. We know they're there. We've sent submersibles down. People have seen these. We've taken pictures of these, and that's what you're looking at in this picture here. And these will show up in a minute. There we have the North America plate over here. Here's the Cascadia Trench and we have convergence taking place here. And here are our volcanoes on the mid-ocean ridge. Here's our line of volcanoes here, the Cascade Mountains, from the subduction of this ocean plate underneath the North America plate. And there are some of them. Here we are in California. There's Lassen, Mount Shasta. That's Mount St. Helens erupting. Here's Mount Rainier, which is uh, outside of Seattle. A big mountain. And then I think you saw this before. We were looking at the eruption history of these volcanoes. Mount St. Helens uh, is, is the most eruptive over the past 4,000 years. I think Mount Shasta comes in second. So volcanic eruptions, volcano, volcanic mudslides where the volcano collapses basically, and that's what these uh, little hills are around um, Mount Shasta. It wasn't until Mount St. Helens erupted that uh, geologists really knew what had caused these little mounds, and it's just the landslide um, from the volcano giving itself up, the volcano sliding. And what else do we have here? Earthquakes, yes, we certainly have earthquakes. And 
these are just some pictures showing damages from some earthquakes that we've had in Northern California. And along with earthquakes come the potential for um, tsunami activity. And the Cascadia subduction zone is one of these areas that people have a sense of complacency in Southern California and the Bay Area, you know, there, there are constant shakes there. You don't really get that in the Cascadia subduction zone. And one of the reasons why is the Juan de Fuca plate, it's almost like it's on ball bearing. So it just slides down very easily. You don't get any places where it gets caught on the North America plate to allow these stresses to build up. They are there but we just don't see them in all these earthquakes, but those stresses have been building for a long time. Um, about 300 years, I would think. The last big earthquake was on January 26, uh, 17, I'm gonna say 1700s. I'll check on that to make sure. But that was when the last big one was that caused a huge tsunami in Japan. In Japan, they were really good at recording earthquakes and recording tsunamis, but when that tsunami hit in Japan, they hadn't recorded an earthquake. So they called it a, the phantom tsunami because it came from kind of nowhere. Well, it turns out that historical, well, not historical records, but um, uh, records from digging into sediments show that in the in that area around off of uh, offshore of Washington um, there was a, a geologist that started trenching into the sediments and he had mud 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 and then came to this point where there was all of this sand that had washed in so the mud was like the the swampy area back from the beach and then the sand was from the beach. So the only way that could have happened was all this ocean water carrying the sand on top of it. And those were dated at around 1700. Again, I'm gonna check on that date to make sure that I'm giving you the right one. I know January 26th is the date because I always remember it because that's my birthday. So a big one could hit in Seattle, Portland, and people aren't really prepared for uh, a big earthquake in those areas. Yes, I just checked and it was 1700 when the last major earthquake was felt in that area. So those stresses have been building up since then. What you're looking at now is uh, a horrible tsunami uh, in Japan from the, um, the Tohoku earthquake that happened in, I think, 2011. And we'll talk more about these, about tsunami when we get into the earthquake chapter. So let me just get out of here. And we've already discussed these. These are again, just volcanoes of the Cascades and these happen to be volcanoes of the Andes Mountains. And you see how similar they look to each other. That's Mount Shasta and Shastina. And that of course is Mount St. Helens after it blew. And then that brings us to uh, continent, continent convergent plate margins. Continental plates are too buoyant to subduct, but the plates collide with each other. So the crust crumples up, crinkles up, wrinkles up, giving us humongous folded mountains. The Himalayas are an example where that's happening today, where India and the Eurasia plate are, are colliding with each other. The Alps, the Urals, the Appalachian Mountains. Um, no volcanoes here because there's no subduction taking place here. So this is showing India. There was an ocean between India and Asia before India arrived at Asia's shores. So remember um, McPhee saying that marine limestone is at the top of Mount Everest? Well, marine limestone is one of those ophiolites and it had been formed on that ocean that was there between India and Asia before India arrived at the shores. This shows that a little better. Uh, here's, the, here's India, here's the ocean between. So we have these ophiolites that are here. 
ophiolites that are here, the accretionary wedge for arc basin, and then when India when India got there, here, here's India. So again, too um, buoyant to subduct. So these two massive plates just started converging into each other and those ocean floor rocks that were on that previous ocean floor just got smooshed up ever higher, higher, higher. And that's why there's marine limestone at the top of Mount Everest. So there are no volcanoes, but there are lots of earthquakes. One earthquake in particular that happened in 2015 was a 7.8 moment magnitude. That's a pretty high magnitude earthquake. It was nine miles deep. There was a 10 mile rupture and there were over 4,000 dead and more fatalities probably. This is a fairly old slide. So there are probably more that died as a result. The aftershocks were as high as 6.6. .6. So this was in the capital of Nepal, Kathmandu and it sits in a dried lake bed. That is the worst kind of soil to build on if you are living in earthquake prone areas because it liquefies. Um, there were avalanches around Mount Everest and you can see here are the Himalayas right here and all these thrust faults as these two plates just you know continue to crash into each other. You have crust that is breaking, crust that is being thrust on top of other crust. So of course there are going to be earthquakes. Uh, anytime you have a fault line, you have the potential for an earthquake to occur. And this, this is Kathmandu. This was one of their famous monuments, kind of like our Washington Monument. That would be as important to them as our Washington Monument would be to us. And that's what happened to it during the earthquake. These are some other damages from the earthquake. The roads cracked. And then there's more cracking of the roads. And then look at these buildings. This is what happens when you don't have an economy that allows you to build buildings to any sort of seismic code. And again, it didn't help matters that the ground was just liquefying. So the foundation just disappeared out from under these poorly constructed buildings. And here's where it's all happening. Here's India, here's the Himalayas, here's that Tibetan plateau, highest place in the world. Here's Japan, Island Arc, here are the Philippines, Island Arc, here's Indonesia, Island Arc, and there's our Red Sea. Notice how the Arabian Peninsula just seems to fit right back in there. That's because it used to, but volcanic activity started and the Red, St Red Sea started opening up and this is what we, this is the current situation that we have and then right up here let me see if I can actually get one of these pins to write properly now this is Iceland right here dang oh well and this is what the Himalayas look like. Notice how different these look from the volcanic mountains that we've been looking at. These are stronger because it's crumpled crust stacked up, compressed together. Um, still eroded as I'll get out, but you can see how much stronger these mountains look than the, than the volcanic mountains. This is one of the, this was a base camp for people that were going to be climbing um, to Mount Everest and there was an avalanche that was triggered by the Kathmandu earthquake and there were uh, many people that were killed in here. Then that brings us to transform plate boundaries. That's where plates slide past each other so we don't have crust either created or destroyed or do we? Mother Earth isn't neat. We'd look at the San Andreas Fault as a good example of a transform fault, but there are places along that uh, fault where we have a little bit of compression taking place, and there are places along that fault where we have a little bit of divergence taking place. 
If you've ever been to Santa Cruz, you probably drove through the Santa Cruz Mountains. Why are those mountains there? They're there because that's an area along the San Andreas Fault where there's compression taking place. Um, Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley, uh, the valley that Lake Berryessa is in, those are called pull-apart valleys. Those are areas of divergence along the San Andreas Fault system, I should say. Um, everybody thinks the San Andreas Fault is just one major fault line. It is, but it's got hundreds of faults associated with it. Um, so the San Andreas is an example of a transform plate boundary. Then another place is the Anatolia Fault ac uh, across northern Turkey. Um, I'll show you a map later on and I'm going to circle some of these areas that we've talked about so you understand where they are in relation to each other and where they are located on the globe. So the purpose or functions of transform faults, they allow for differential spreading rates. They adapt a linear feature, which is a spreading ridge, to a spherical surface. Again, you can't have just these neat straight gashes that are opening up on a spherical surface. You have to have some accommodation and that accommodation are the transform faults. The majority of these are found on, in ocean basins. There are a dime a dozen in ocean basins. And here's our old friend, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. There's the Rift Valley down the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And you see that that rift valley is not continuous. There are these offsets in it. Everywhere you have an offset, like here's a good offset here, here's another good one right here, those are transform faults. So we've got lots of these on the bottom of the ocean floor. By the way, you can see the continental shelf area here. Had Alfred Wegener had continental shelves mapped so that he could put the continents back together again, he would have seen that the match is way, I started to say way gooder, the match is way better than when you try to match them up at the continents, at the continental coastlines. This is on, on the East Pacific rise. So here's a mid-ocean ridge here. Here's a mid, oh look, it actually drew that time. Um, I'm going to jinx myself though. Here's a mid, yeah, I did. Here's a mid ocean ridge over, ow, get the laser pointer. Here's a mid ocean ridge here. They're offset from each other, and that's a transform fault. So this side of the ridge is moving that way, this side of the ridge is moving that way. So we have this sliding past motion right here where there's transform. And that's where the, that's the type of thing that the North America plate moved over and formed the San Andreas Fault. That motion was translated up through the, uh, the North America plate. So now we have one part of California, a sliver of California that's on the Pacific plate and the other part of California on the North America plate. The San Andreas Fault separates those two plates. And let's pretend this is the mid-ocean ridge and that was the Farallon plate here and this is the Pacific plate here. Once that mid-ocean ridge got to the edge of North America, then guess what arrived with it? The other side of the ridge was a new plate, the Pacific plate. So again, Farallon plate, two sections of it left, the Juan de Fuca to the north and the Cocos to the south. The rest of it, hey, accreted on to the edge of North America to make North America larger. And this is what it looks like from the air. Um, so this is the Pacific plate over here to the left. This is the North America plate to the right. And we see this creek crossing and look how it's been shifted to the north. It's catching a ride on that plate movement. Um, so again, here's the, uh, the Pacific plate, here's the North America plate. So Los Angeles, San Diego, they're getting a ride ever closer and closer and closer to San Francisco. San Francisco is right on the edge of the North America plate. So LA, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara, uh, they're all getting closer and closer to San Francisco. And there's another view of that dog leg in the creek. And that's typical. Homes around Hayward, 
built around on the fault, on the Hayward Fault, which is a, a branch of the San Andreas Fault, um, they shift, they move. Berkeley Stadium is built on top of the Hayward Fault and it had to have a big retrofit several years ago because of all of the, the breakages that were taking place. And these are lakes that are in these saggy areas where there's this, all this motion. This is outside of San Francisco, south of San Francisco. That's Crystal Reservoir and San Andreas Lake. Those are part of San Francisco's water supply. And we have lots of earthquakes here. The 1906 San Francisco earthquake, uh, the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, all the earthquakes that occur in Southern California. This was the 1971 San Fernando earthquake that was the wake up call that we are not building our roads properly in earthquake country. So the driving mechanism behind plate tectonics are these thermal convection cells that are driven from, uh, by heat from Earth's interior. There are two processes that go on. There's slab pull, where the subducting colder slabs pull the rest of the plate down into the asthenosphere. And the current scientific theory supports that that slab pull is much more important in moving things around than the other way that things can happen, ridge push. Gravity pushes plates from higher ocean ridges to trenches. Again, that is, accounts for just a small fraction, but both these together uh, help in the movement of, of these plates. Okay, that's it for now. See you later.